Okay, hello everyone. I'm Brendan Conway Smith, working with Dr. West and Dr. Milopoulos. I'm going to be presenting metacognitive skill and how it's acquired. So this is a novel framework that we developed about how there's a missing framework for how metacognitive skills is created. And this is based on a paper that uh, will be published at Cognitive Science. And it's about how we're trying to create one of the first frameworks for explaining the cognitive mechanisms underlying metacognitive skill learning. So just a little overview, some basic terminology before we dive in. Okay, so metacognition, big word, but we all know what it is in terms of it's controlling some, some mental state or monitoring some state. So if you've ever controlled your attention, you know what it's like to squeeze a mental muscle to focus on that thing you need to do right now. You're probably focusing right now in some way. Everybody knows what it's like to control some emotion. Say you're at uh, in a business meeting or at the dinner table and you're feeling maybe tired or frustrated, you're trying to control an emotion, uh, to not show it or to mitigate it in some way. So evidence shows that metacognitive skill, the controlling of your mental state, can become more skillful. You can get better at it. And this is very important in education. This is being in increasingly used in cognitive behavior therapy as helping people to control their own mental states beneficially. Uh, but there's a problem. And the problem is, as you heard, the mechanisms aren't really well known. We don't really know what are the underlying cognitive underpinnings, and it lacks a theoretical framework. So this paper proposes the first framework for understanding the mechanisms underlying metacognitive skill. And the value is that, uh, you know, it's plausible to think that a better understanding of metacognitive skill learning will help in its application, will help in its teaching, and will help it to be applied wherever it's applicable. So that's what we're hoping to do. Uh, so metacognitive skill really is referring to just the extent to which you can monitor your own mental states, to which, the extent to which you can control your attention or emotion or even memory or all the different ways you can guide some mental process beneficially. As I said, there's an abundance of studies showing that you can get better with practice meta-memory, attention, uh, monitoring, all these different things, but there's no process model. We just see that it works. We just don't understand what's happening in the engine beneath the hood. And it's being increasingly talked about as a skill, but with no understanding and no bridging of the skill literature. So there's a, there's a lot of research in metacognition, and there's a lot of research in skill learning, but there's no there's not a lot of communication between these two domains. So we're bridging this gap and we're trying to show how metacognition can be hugely helped in terms of our understanding by, by, by importing the, the literature on, on skill. So that's what we're doing. So there's decades and decades of, of research. Uh, various skill learning models have been really successful in detailing the mechanisms that work in motor skill, in, in cognitive skill like math or, or chess. And we're gonna say that you know, we propose the same model can be used to explain metacognitive skill, and this hasn't been done. So this novel framework can help to explain metacognitive skill, its cognitive underpinnings, and to shed light on, on otherwise unexplainable data. There's a lot of unexplainable empirical data out there, and this uh, well-established framework for understanding skill acquisition can be imported to clarify. Now, skill learning is described in psychology and philosophy as a progression from slow and deliberate rule following to uh, a procedural stage where aspects of performance are faster, more accurate, and more automatic. We all know what that's like to be slow and deliberate at something at first and then become faster and more automatic at it. And this seems to just apply wherever skill is. And many accounts of skill learning help to explain this through a concept of proceduralization. Proceduralization, this is an important core concept of how skill learning develops. How do we go from declarative slow task knowledge to faster procedural knowledge? And this is a, a method of proceduralization. So there's a huge convergence in skill literature and showing how you know, human cognition has a few tricks that it does on a lot of different things. And in this case, uh, this process of moving from, as you can see in the top quadrant, from declarative knowledge to faster speed up of procedural knowledge moves through these three stages. So first, declarative knowledge. Everybody knows what it's like to start driving for their first time. There's somebody in the passenger seat giving you declarative instructions. Put the key in there, this much gas, no, not too much, you know, not too much brake. And you get these declarative instructions. And in the second stage, you get procedural knowledge uh, being guided by declarative knowledge as you're learning just the feeling of how much gas or brake or how to turn properly. And as a result of procedural knowledge 
being activated by declarative knowledge, your performance speeds up, your errors go down, and in the end there you can see uh, procedural knowledge as one of the third stages where actions are largely reliant on procedural knowledge, where it's just fast, automatic, you know, you can drive without even really knowing what you're doing. <laughs> you can have a conversation with somebody in the, in the passenger seat because you have built up largely uh, less conscious procedural knowledge that's just automatic. You know, sometimes you can, your mind can just wander for blocks while you're driving and having very little, very little attention that needs to actually go towards uh, some skill you've mastered. And this is a process of proceduralization where you have declarative knowledge, it's facts, rules, that then move to fast procedural knowledge. So declarative to procedural is this process of proceduralization. And the building and refining of procedural knowledge is one of those convergences. And Anderson provides a computational explanation, famously, of what are the computational mechanisms in the brain that uh, give rise to this. So we're going to talk about this relying largely on the nature of procedural knowledge. Anderson uses a computational cognitive architecture called ACTAR, which depends on procedural knowledge. And procedural knowledge is computationally articulated as production rules, production rules. These units of procedural knowledge that run, they transform information. They're the doing part of the system. They actually act out the tasks and they change the system. They go about a problem solving and they're modeled on computer program instructions in the form of a condition action pairing. So it specifies a condition that when met performs a prescribed action. You can also think about this as an if then rule. If it matches a the condition, then it fires an action. If then, match fire, match fire, and it moves the system. So here's a little animation that helps clarify this. So you have declarative and procedural knowledge. So some instruction. Procedural knowledge is if then, if there's some instruction, then it'll act out that instruction and it moves the system, it directs the system as it, as it goes about some tasks such as driving or chess or whatever it is. So we see we're going to look at these three stages of skill acquisition here where we talk about a novice bringing in declarative knowledge into their working memory. So there's declarative knowledge in working memory. There's procedural knowledge that arises to act out the instruction, it acts out the instruction. So declarative knowledge an instruction for driving or chess or whatever, moving into working memory, and then procedural knowledge acting it out. And in the middle stage, we have proceduralization. So we have fast, automatic, more fast, more automatic procedural knowledge. And what it does is it starts skipping the instructions. Procedural knowledge starts getting associated with the cue itself. You get in the car, your body just knows what to do. You know, you can be thinking of something else entirely. And this happens in skill acquisition where the procedural knowledge starts getting activated on its own. It doesn't need the instructions anymore. It skips, it fires. Uh, largely automatically and as a result of it being faster it gets rewarded by the system and it's more likely to be used the next time as a result. And the expert stage is you've got all this procedural knowledge, it moves fast automatically and you just drive, you just play chess, you just do anything you're doing uh, automatically, uh, accurately, effectively and this is the method of proceduralization and we're going to say that this helps us understand all levels of skill and this has been used to understand Motor skill, cognitive skills, I said, and we're saying that metacognitive skill can be hugely clarified through this, this framework. So this is a less beautiful diagram. That, this is from our paper in Cognitive Science, showing how metacognition can go through these three stages of skill acquisition. And I'll just kind of start with the top there. So again, as always, you have a novice, and you have meta-instructions for how to control your attention, Meta instructions like in cognitive behavior therapy, how to control an emotion. It's retrieved into working memory, which then directs production rules, procedural memory. And again, proceduralization occurs, starts to become associated with the cue itself. Production starts to skip the instructions, don't need them anymore. It becomes associated with the cue itself. So you're in a situation where you need to focus. You start to focus automatically. You're in a situation where you need to control some emotion or engage in some meta memory technique. It starts to happen automatically. And so the metacognitive expert has this metacognitive production rules firing automatically. You just focus automatically. You just control some emotion automatically. So that's the framework. And we're going to be seeing how it actually helps clarify a lot of the empirical evidence out there. Now, you have to maybe dip into our paper to see all the different areas, attentional control, emotional control. But here's one area 
uh, where evidence for proceduralized emotion, emotional control, proceduralized metacognition, presents as confounding data in the literature. They don't know what to make of it. And our lens, our, our framework helps to understand. So in skill research, there's this one phenomenon, you probably all heard about it, where athletes under pressure can have their performance disrupted, also known as choking. So say you have a Tiger Woods and they're at some big golf tournament and a normal putt that they could make 10 times out of 10 because it's a lot of pressure, because there's a lot of crowds out there, they, they're sweating it and they can miss something that's a, quite an easy skill, uh, choking. So they, they, they're, some pressure, some anxiety disrupts their performance. Now here's the paradox that they've shown in research. Athletes who are more self-conscious normally are less likely to choke. Athletes, in other words, who routinely feel more self-conscious anxiety have their performance disrupted less often. Now, why would that be? We, we sort of expect the opposite. Somebody who's cool and calm normally should be cool and calm under pressure. But you're finding people who routinely engage in or, or have to deal with or grapple with their own anxiety or self-consciousness are cooler under pressure as a result. Now, what explains this counterintuitive data that we see over and over? Well, uh, one of the lead researchers hypothesized that, you know, those who routinely experience more self-conscious anxiety have greater practice at self-regulation. They have greater practice dealing with it day to day, and this practice uh, comes to aid their performance when under pressure, just arises and guides their performance, helping them to be cool, calm, and make that shot. And so what we're seeing here are the hallmark signs of proceduralization. You're seeing an improvable skill that's practiced, over and over, and then just automatically comes to work for you. It just arises when situational cues trigger that skill. Procedural knowledge arises, working outside of working memory, requires minimal attention, and while this data in the literature has been confounding people for you know, decades, we can apply this metacognitive skill framework to help us understand what's actually happening underneath the hood, what cognitive mechanisms are actually going on, and so this initially paradoxical data can be made sense of in the light of proceduralized metacognition. Now, of course, there's other areas, but our paper is up for, for viewing. Three minutes. Three minutes, perfect. This is the last line. Thank you, Arthur. All right, so framework helping us to clarify the empirical evidence. And there's limitation, now, since this is a, a novel initial framework, we need to clarify that explanations of metacognitive skill, explanations of skill in general, aren't totally exhausted by theories of automaticity, of increasing automatic behavior. Now, in truth, elite skill never fully automatizes. Olympic level skill uh, athletes are always still conscious and really trying to direct their behavior deliberately, but increasing automaticity is one important aspect of skill acquisition that's that's one of those points of convergence. So we thought that would be a very important place to begin this process of increasing automaticity. <coughs> now, this is intended to be testable. This is intended to provide testable hypothesis so we can test if the model and its hypothesized stages align with empirical data that results from metacognitive training. So we can compare the framework to the actual empirical data. And we can investigate whether the neural correlates of metacognitive skill learning correspond to the same pattern of activation found in similar studies of motor and skill learning. Is it, is metacognitive skill a long lost cousin of motor skill and cognitive skill? Well, it should show very similar patterns of activation and have the same sort of timing speed up as a result. So a question remains, we think this is an important question. And that question is, how can human cognition come to be more skillful at directing its own processes? How can human cognition not only be skillful at external tasks, but skillful at directing its own processes beneficially? We think this is an important question. We think that this metacognitive skill framework helps us at least give some, some framework for the mechanisms involved, and it is meant to guide investigation and further discussion. So thank you. <laughs>